tu sole, più bella ne o oh sole mia sta in fronte a te, o oh sole, o oh sole mia sta in fronte a te, sta in fronte a te. That's all I got this morning. <laughs> what do we got here? That's pretty good for a person to have a late night because we're in bed before he gets home. That's pretty good for someone early in the morning, isn't it? I was just saying to Campbell, when I, when I, when I got into my car, my car was still warm from finishing at 1.30 1, a.m. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks for asking me to come by. I mean, and for me to speak about probably the most boring topic in my life is talking about me. So um, I'll, 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 I'll give you a bit of an insight. My name is David DeVito. Um, so the son, a uh, child of uh, immigrants that came to Australia in the 50s. I was born in 73 to a four foot 11 Italian woman. And uh, I was, uh, uh, yeah, 58 centimetres long and 10 pounds back in the day where they didn't have caesarean. So that was, a, I think it was a 26-hour labour, I, I was told. So, um, so I come into this world big and happy. And um, my middle name is Felice, which means happiness. My, well, my your dad's small too, though, isn't he? Yeah, he's five foot nothing too. Actually, my name is DeVito, as I mentioned. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of people associate me with the famous actor Danny DeVito. And the funny story is my father had two uncles that both went to America uh, also but earlier in the in the in the 30s and 40s and um, in the 40s sorry and uh, one of the uncles despised Italy so much and and the story goes that um, as as they was going to the ship to to go to anywhere other than Italy um, one of the brothers tripped over and, and broke his nose uh, on, on, as, as, when he tripped over. And, and in the blood, he wrote, F.U. Italy. <laughs> and, that, and that person is Danny DeVito's father. So Danny DeVito, the famous actor, is actually my father's second cousin. So we actually are related, although you can't really tell. My father looks exactly like Danny DeVito, actually. My, my father my father's quite sm was quite small in stature. But um, growing up in the 70s, I'm from South Australia, born in South Australia and uh, in a low to middle class uh, suburb. Um, grew up, you know, I'm the third son of six boys. So uh, we all feel sorry for mum at times and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and a very musical family. My father came here, as I said, in the 50s with my mum. Uh, they didn't know each other at the time they met in Australia. And uh, my father was an opera singer. In, uh, in Italy and came to Australia and, and was part of the Australian Opera Company for, for a short amount of time. Um, so in, in, the, in, the, in the household, there was always music. My father was always up at 5 a.m. making espresso coffee for mom and, and serenading my mother early in the morning. Um, yeah, it was, it was an awesome childhood, I have to say. Um, we had, uh, so my folks came from a farming background in Italy. Um, or from different parts of, of Italy, although from the same region, Campania in Italy. My father was from Avellino, my, um, my mother was from San Giorgio, but still in that sort of farming uh, sort of type, that rural part of Italy. So um, they came to Australia with those real old-fashioned values. And uh, we had a little bit of land, and my father every morning, as I was mentioned, he'd, he'd uh, sing to my mother at 5 a.m. in the morning, wake her up with an espresso, and he'd pick uh, a rose or a flower from the garden and, and give it to her. My mother's name is Rosa. So, uh, so my, my father was very romantic and I sort of grew up with that sort of mindset. Um, so around, around the family there was always music. We had a, a hundred year old German grand piano, uh, uh, just upright piano. And um, from a very early age, I used to climb up on the piano from you know five, six years old and I used to sort of bang around the piano. And my father would say, you know, there's, some, there's something going on here because I would listen to commercials on, on, the, uh, on, the, on the television and I would sort of mimic them on the piano. And they, they said, oh, you know, this, this kid's got something going on. So when I was uh, seven years old, I started um, learning piano, started doing uh, the exams. And uh, the professor had, uh, that was uh, assessing me realised very early on that I had what's called perfect pitch, which is a very rare thing where you can hear sounds and I see sound in colour as well. So I, um, music was a big part of my life growing up. And uh, 
you know, went through high school, uh, finished high school. My folks um, thought they'd move up to Queensland, so they brought the whole family. So we came up, we came up in, the, in the early 90s, 91. And um, I, I was kind of, did, didn't know what to do with my life. I was uh, trying to get jobs here and there. I was, I was classically trained. So getting a job here on the Gold Coast in the, in the early 90s as, a, as an opera singer was quite difficult. And as most uh, entertainers or actors or people in the arts, they end up in, in somebody's sink washing dishes for a restaurant. And, that was, and I was no different. So I found myself uh, washing dishes uh, in a little place at Main Beach. Fell in love with the waitress who was the boss's daughter. We got together and uh, that's, you know, over a short amount of time, I said, do you want to own a restaurant? Do you want to open a restaurant? So I go, well, I don't have any money. And, uh, and she didn't have any money either. So we went around and her father found this tiny little place in Labrador um, and it was called the Fox's Lair. So it was a bit of an iconic uh, venue, had been there forever. And uh, it was owned by a brother-sister New Zealand couple and they were, set, they were going broke. They were interior decorators, thought they would get into the restaurant game. And, and they, they, they failed, but they left this cute little restaurant. It was a very quaint, beautiful little restaurant that only seated maybe 20, 25 people, very, very small. It's still open today. It's, under, it's had many, many name changes over the years. So we bought this place for $5,000, and I thought, what else? You know, I, I was going to learn the, the, the trade on the job, and she was already a great cook, so we, we started this thing together. And... Um, and knowing nothing about business, we just thought we'd, we'd, we'd wing it. Anyway, within six months, she ran off and I was left there by myself. And I thought, what am I going to do? So I got my computer and I started uh, printing out little things, you know, come to see this, this little place. And it was called Chow, as in hello, goodbye. And that was a stupid, that was a stupid name to call it. Because n no Australian could read it because Chow was spelled C-I-A-O. And they go, we're going to Kyo, we're going... <laughs> So anyway, that, that, was, that was difficult. And as, as I mentioned, I knew nothing about business. And uh, I, was do I was going door to door saying, you know, I was only 20 years. I just turned 20. So I was going, you know, come and see me. I'm, I'm at this place and blah, blah, blah. And nobody would come. So for, for, the, first, um, for the first year, it was, it was pretty much empty. And I was so behind in rent. I thought, what am I going to do? So uh, singing was my first love. So out the front in downtown Labrador, where in the early 90s it was known as Stabrador, very rough area, hence why I bought the joint for $5,000. I mean, I, I, mean I, I, was, I was so naive. So I thought, well, while I'm here, you know, going broke, I might just do some practice. So I went out the front and I started practicing guitar because I, I was more, I was a classical pianist. So I was playing guitar at the front and I was singing. And then all of a sudden people that were ordering Chinese and fish and chips next door, they would sort of look and they go, well, you, and I'll go, oh, no, I'm just practicing. And then all of a sudden, someone would go by and put $5 in, in the guitar case, and then someone else would put $5 in. Wow. And then someone would say, uh, what, what do you do here? I go, well, I own the joint. And, you know, he go, well, do you, have, do you sell food? I go, yeah, I'm trying to sell something. <laughs> so slowly, slowly, people would sort of come in, and, and, and that, was, that was sort of like the, the birth of, of the singing chef. So I would go out the front, I'd be busking out the front, sing a few tunes. People would come in and order stuff. I'd go out the back, cook their food, go out the front, and I'd sing again. And then I would slowly get busier and busier and busier. And then my parents would, would get involved as well. Like mum and dad were sort of retired anyway. So they'd come in and they'd, and they'd sort of help me out. So it was just me, my folks. And, um, and that's sort of how my life began in, in this industry. Um, I never really thought I'd see myself in the food industry, but I've been here for 30 years. So that first place went from, for the first year, it was, you know, basically doing nothing and, 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 and you know, it was hard to, it's always hard to sell a secret and nobody knew who I was or what I was doing. But within a short uh, sort of a space of time, um, it became an iconic venue and it's still one of the very most uh, spoken about institutions on the Gold Coast. It, they got to a stage there after the first year where you'd have to wait three months to get a seat on a Monday. It was absolutely packed. And with a, with a tiny little restaurant, it had this wonderful bustling uh, little, um, uh, little vibe about it. But uh, soon enough, there were some residents there. Uh, this is the beginning of, oh. of my life story. <laughs> residents complaining to council that, you know, there's that bloody wog over there. He's bloody making all this noise. He, he's singing Valare and we're sick of it. We're, that's amore, that's enough. So... Uh, yeah, we had issues from the, a couple of neighbours that were just whinging and complaining. I thought, you know what, I've, I've done this long enough. I was there for 30, uh, 11 years. And I thought, you know what, I'll, I'll expand. I'll find something else. So I found another place 
the neighbors didn't like me too much there or one one neighbor didn't like um the uh, the stuff that i was doing so i thought no i'll, I'll get out you know I, was, I had i'd been there long enough found another place and uh, it was a much much larger place uh, and that was in labrador next to the caravan park where the old pete's hut used to be so i, I was there for a few years uh found a great uh, young lady got married and um, we, we had that business for a few years. It ended up being a development site, so we got kicked out of that place. Um, that was wonderful experience. Then, we, then um, I moved over to... Uh, th then my family started a, a business called Fratelli's, and they did a similar thing in the Southport Mall, uh, where, where my other brothers were getting involved in that. I had a bit of a hiatus from, from restaurants and, and got back into music touring Australia. And uh, during that time, uh, I, yeah, I found another place that was quite successful as well. And I found that the, my niche in, in business was doing something that very, very few people did. And that was incorporating music and, and food, which was my two great loves. So I really enjoyed creating uh, meals and coming up with new concepts on food and also singing was my passion as well. So that place was called Chow on the, on the, uh, in Labrador. And that was, that, was a, that was a wonderful time where I got to sing every night. I had more staff. I could sort of afford to put people on. And my, my role there was to cook. Uh, and I had other chefs as well and to, um, uh, and to perform every night. Anyway, uh, I started doing some you know, singing outside, people got to know who I was. And then um, in 2010, I got a phone call from um, what I thought was my brother giving me a prank call, and it was a guy called Mark Holden from Australian Idol. And he rang me and said, hello, um, I'm, I'm, my name is Mark Holden. I went, ha ha, hang up. <laughs> nice one, because my, my brothers, we, 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 all do, we all do pranks on each other all the time. <laughs> So anyway, after the third time, he said, please don't hang up. My name is Mark Holden, and um, I heard your singing on a, on a CD that, uh, in a Melbourne restaurant. And I spoke to the, the owner there, and I said, who's this guy? He sounds a bit like Bocelli. He sounds a bit like Josh Groban. He sounds, who is this guy? And they said, no, he's an Australian guy. He's from the Gold Coast. And I used to leave my telephone number on the CDs I used to sell. So he rang me. He said, you know, we want you to be part of this. And I said, no, 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 I'm not interested. Because at that time... I was sort of in and out of restaurants and I was happy to sing and I was getting paid really, really good money um, to do what I did. Um, so anyway, after a bit of convincing and the, the, uh, the head of Fremantle Media rang me and said, look, we need someone like you on this show. You can choose what show you want because you, you can be on X Factor or Australia's Got Talent. And I wasn't a big fan of X Factor because I, 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 was, I, I did study music and I, I wasn't going to be told by someone like Kyle Sanderlands how to sing or how to suck <laughs> eggs. So I said, look, I'm not, I'm not interested. Um, anyway, it was the, the last phone call who said, look, 